I'm Lynn Packer. This presentation makes the case for a smartphone news gathering based business model to abate America's local news crisis. The business model I suggest joins lots of others. There's no shortage of them, many of which are now being tried by online news outlets, as reflected by headlines such as Can News Be Made into a Sustainable Business? Local Journalism, Innovative Business Approaches. A new business model emerges. Meet the Digital News Co-op. Nonprofit business model may offer stability to local newsrooms. That model is trending. Here are a few often used in combination. Advertising, nonprofit ownership, foundation grants, ultra-wealthy donors. Nonprofit status is often needed to attract grants from foundations and rich donors who pump millions of dollars a year into the saving local news cause. Going on with models, paywalls, subscriptions, solutions journalism, direct federal funding, and as most of you know, that's sort of on hold right now. Finally, what this presentation is about, video as a business model via smartphone news gathering plus an emphasis on advertising. The video priority model exists only on paper. I don't think anyone has yet tried a major pivot to video. I'll begin with a checklist of features intended to improve a news outlet's chances of sustainability. Substantial use of video. Video that meets the highest professional standards, not the amateur video that characterized last decade's disastrous pivots to video. All reporters trained, equipped as video journalists. Sufficient reporter numbers to cover multiple beats. Excellent pay, not just barely adequate. Advertising, the main revenue source. High journalism standards with firewalls. Truth be told, many of the dead and dying local news outlets never had high standards, never engaged in watchdog accountability journalism, and too often prioritized advertising over reporting. What's not on my list may be even more controversial than what's on it. Going nonprofit, tax deductions for donors and tax exemptions for the news operation. Not on the list seeking big charitable grants from billionaires and from massive trusts, except maybe for startup seed funding, not beyond that. And redefining journalism to attract audience. I'm talking about the fad pseudo-journalism movements, often called civic or public or solutions or constructive journalism. Way off the list. Here is a possible newsroom organization chart, simplified, somewhat similar to many news organizations. An editor-in-chief or CEO presides over both the editorial and marketing departments. A managing editor runs the news gathering side. Reporters are skilled and trained as video journalists, which is unique under this concept. Then you have the necessary editors and support staff. A business manager runs the revenue side. He or she directs the sales staff, in-house advertising production, which includes video ad production. Again, a feature unique to this model. A traditional firewall separates news gathering and revenue functions. Each site has its own policy manual that helps maintain the firewall. Next, a closer look at the model's two most important concepts. Video, for both news and advertising, produced almost entirely with smartphones, and advertising is the main income source, with a strong firewall. But first, breaking news about a newly released local news business model. It's called the Roadmap for Local News, an emergent approach to meeting civic information needs, published earlier this year. The question... Is this model a roadmap to a sustainable local news organization, or in my opinion, is a roadmap to local news disaster? It could result in massive amounts of taxpayer-subsidized philanthropic funding going down the drain. 
The roadmap for local news is not a sign for hope, but a reason for despair. If this is what journalism's best and brightest can come up with, then sustainable, principled local news is really doomed. One critic says the roadmap is paved with wet cement. That's being kind. I think the roadmap is paved with something slimier and smellier than wet cement. The report says, The roadmap for local news was built on conversations with more than 50 local news folks, leaders of nonprofit news organizations and funders. It focuses on civic information and civic media. The roadmap is co-authored by Elizabeth Green of Chalkbeat, Daryl Holliday of City Bureau, and Mike Rispoli of Free Press. Support came from the Knight Foundation, Ford Foundation, Democracy Fund, MacArthur Foundation, Walton Family Foundation, and the American Journalism Project. These are what I think are the roadmap's deficiencies. It redefines news as civic information. It transforms who produces journalism, how they produce it, and how it is funded. It says the community librarian is as celebrated as the dogged reporter pursuing a scoop. It prioritizes billionaire philanthropy and nonprofit approaches. It says civic media has proven that its work does not need to be commercial to be sustainable. It says more philanthropy inspires more corporate giving. It says in 2021, the nonprofit news sector grew to an estimated $400 million in total annual revenue. It says we have a variety of tested and proven, remember it says tested and proven models, common principles and best practices, and many overlapping civic media networks ready for expansion to communities across the United States. One of the roadmap's examples involves these related New Jersey entities. It says, New Jersey is a required stop on any roadmap for local news. New Jersey claims to be a model for local journalism innovation. It embraces an everyone can be a journalist concept. It supports constructive journalism, also known as solutions, civic, or public journalism. And it prioritizes philanthropy donor funding. Here are some excerpts from a New Jersey News Commons video. I think the future of local news is all about community. The future of local news is New Jersey. It's exactly what is happening here, because I believe the future of local news is bottom-up ecosystems. A new framework for understanding the information landscape, not as a collection of individual silos, but as an interconnected ecosystem of journalists, information providers, and media organizations of all shapes and sizes. We called it the New Jersey News Commons. The Roadmap's three main authors would not grant interviews. I give them an F for transparency. Seattle Times columnist Briar Dudley posted his reaction to the Roadmap online. He wrote, I fear this project could be starting on the wrong foot with potential journalism funders being led astray. It's a new report effectively urging big donors to let local newspapers die off. The report also suggests that online nonprofit civic media has found the magic key to success and proven that its work does not need to be commercial to be sustainable. Such outlets regularly fail, and sustainability is a challenge for many, just like legacy media. Dan Kennedy, a Northeastern University journalism professor, wrote, A new report urges a pivot beyond local journalism into civic information. It can be difficult in places to figure out exactly what they have in mind. Now, I admire and respect librarians as much as the next person, but when it comes to holding government and other powerful institutions to account, I would respectfully suggest that we need more digging and less facilitating. Unfortunately, I think the report's authors really run into trouble when they start telling us what this is all going to cost, between one and five billion dollars. It seems unlikely that the vision laid out in the roadmap for local news will come to pass. Ken Doctor is the CEO of the local news outlet, Lookout Santa Cruz. 
He gives the roadmap a big thumbs down. He wrote, it omits so many places on the map of local news and fails to offer what any roadmap requires, a destination that is real, achievable, and satisfying. It elevates the term civic information over the words journalism and journalists. The roadmap makes invisible digital local news outlets that rely less on donations and offer a high enough level of product and service to win membership, subscription, advertising events, and other income, and are all on track to earn a majority of their revenue from readers and advertisers. The roadmap's news must be free mantra is a disastrous chant. With that roadmap discussion out of the way, here's a deeper look at the video part of my business model. Video could become the single most important factor in rescuing local news. It can heighten news story impact on the editorial side, increase ad revenue on the marketing side. It's likely the main reason most local television newscasts remain profitable, while most local print newspapers are struggling and dying. Video continues to trend. Continue this S&P Business Intelligence report titled Online Video Revenue is Skyrocketing. It says streaming video subscriptions and advertising revenues have raced higher, rising from just over $2 billion in combined revenues in 2010 to likely surpassing the $100 billion mark by 2026. Younger generations are growing up in a world where YouTube, TikTok, and Twitch may be more familiar than networks like ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox. In short, online news outlets need to ride the video tidal wave, not be swept away by it. Of course, some news organizations have at least begun to act, even if not decisively. Nadja Nielsen, BBC News Digital Director, revealed plans to expand the use of video journalists. The VJs are to create more video to appeal to younger audiences. A quote from the story. BBC steps up plans to merge BBC World News with its domestic news channel in an effort to cut costs. Her ambition is to encourage more smartphone camera reporting from journalists as the channel seeks to engage the TikTok generation with live and breaking news in video. Even bigger changes are on the way. The BBC, the largest news broadcaster in the world, is preparing to shut down its traditional television and radio broadcasts as it becomes an online-only service over the next decade. Imagine a world that is internet-only, where broadcast TV and radio are being switched off and choice is infinite. Also consider U.S. cable TV giant Comcast. The headline, Comcast reveals instant TV and the IPTV future. On the reception side, smart TV sales are way up, over 60% market share, enabling TV-only viewers to access the internet and use computer apps and cut their cable cord if they want. If an online news outlet decides to adopt a video-centric business plan, it needs to figure out how to drive video quality way up while driving video production costs way down. Otherwise, there's little chance the plan could help save local journalism. The goal would be to produce video news stories at higher quality than typical local television news at much lower cost. That's why my business model is designed around smartphone video, a mobile all-in-one device that with accessories like microphones and lights, replaces mini cams, edit bays, audio booths, and microwave and satellite trucks. Even though smartphone news gathering is far less expensive than legacy television news gathering, it's still expensive. It requires more reporters calls for higher journalist entry-level skills, needs higher pay for the more highly skilled reporters, requires more powerful IT newsroom video management systems, and drives up equipment purchase and maintenance costs. What can and should professional quality video news stories look like? Philip Bromwell with television network RTE Ireland is a world leader in pioneering and promoting smartphone news gathering. 
He spoke at InspireFest 2018 in Dublin. In my day-to-day -day life, my phone has become really important because basically for the past five years, I've been filming TV reports for RTE News on my phone. My phone has become something of a, a Swiss army knife. I can use it for TV, I can use it for radio, I can use it for online, I can use it for social media. I can film with it, I can edit with it. I can publish from it. And of course, I can go live from it. I'll show some excerpts from a news feature story Bromwell shot using an iPhone 5 about an Irish artisan who is building a replica of a Viking house using Viking-era tools for display at Dublin's National Botanic Gardens. Inch by inch, a sizable project is taking shape. Owen Donnelly is building a house, typical of those found in Dublin a thousand years ago. So it's almost square in shape. It'll be thatched uh, with reed. The walls will be woven out of hazel. Owen is using traditional tools. Um, you know, they put a lot of spirit and soul into their buildings. The Viking House will be assembled at the National Botanic Gardens over the coming weeks. The one in the Botanical Gardens will be slightly different and slightly smaller, but it will look, for all intensive purposes, the same as the one here. Could video be the key for local digital news outlets to succeed? Could it be the holy grail so many online news operations seek to not just survive, but to prosper? Video, after all, is one of many choices, many decisions that could lead to success or even bring about failure. So far, few if any digital news outlets chose a complete pivot to video, instead choosing among other business models. They will sink or swim with those decisions. If they chose the true grail, they will prosper. Choosing a false grail will bring about their demise. I'm sure many believe they've already chosen wisely. Quite a few are primarily banking on the civic, aka solutions journalism concept. Even more popular, going the nonprofit route. That nonprofit status opens up a potentially huge money pipeline to philanthropic grants from foundations and rich donors. Some, at least for the moment, are doing very well prioritizing grants. One danger with grants, though, not only can underfunding lead to death, but overfunding as well. One thing for sure, it's a minefield out there, and any big misstep can be fatal. Assume for a moment that video could be the holy grail. I don't think anybody's tried it yet, but if it is or could be, which type of existing news outlet may be more likely to even try? When I say which type would more likely choose video, I mean a local television news organization or a local print newspaper that somehow survived or a digital-only outlet that began online from scratch. Local TV news is the most logical to fully transition to online video, since they already do video news gathering, even if with obsolete methods and equipment. But no, that's not likely. What about local newspapers, the ones not yet dead? Also extremely unlikely. Finally, what about existing, started-from-scratch digital news outlets? They're more likely. In this next section, I'll take an in-depth look at how one newspaper, my home state paper, the Salt Lake Tribune, is dealing with the local journalism crisis. The story includes a discussion about nonprofit status, grants from foundations, the solutions journalism concept, and, of course, video. After struggling for years, the Salt Lake Tribune chose a billionaire philanthropy solution. The question became, can Paul Huntsman save the Salt Lake Tribune? That did not work out. The Tribune next decided on the nonprofit business model, was the first daily metropolitan newspaper to do it, 
and became the shining light of the legacy newspaper nonprofit movement. For good measure, the Trib also embraced the solutions journalism reporting concept, but it rejected video. Rolling back the clock to 2015, I wrote a series of articles about smartphone video news gathering. Then in 2019, after the Tribune applied to the IRS for nonprofit status, but before approval, I met with the Tribune's consultant, Fraser Nelson, to advocate a full pivot to video. I'll show you some, but not all of the slides I showed her. This is the first slide. As you can tell, I recommended a full pivot to video as opposed to the Tribune's amateurish stick its toe in the water video that years earlier it tried and failed. I described how Utah's local news outlets were going online like a bunch of lemmings plunging into the sea. None of them prioritized digital news delivery over their legacy television and print delivery. None made good use of video on their web pages. I discussed Utah billionaire Paul Huntsman buying the paper and saving it, at least temporarily, but revenues and circulation continued to decline. In 2018, Huntsman cut the staff by a third. I suggested a Salt Lake Tribune survival guide that it consider a business model centered on smartphone news gathering. I asked Nelson to consider these facts. Salt Lake has four local television news departments, all making money by advertising, over the air, not online, albeit no longer licenses to print money. All four cut staffs and ignore traditional journalism values. All four quit beat systems. All four have massive investments in live reporting technology and labor, yet continually do mostly black hole live shots. All four are continually, slowly, and sporadically losing their broadcast audiences. I portray those four local TV news departments as sitting ducks, ready for anyone like the Tribune to easily target them. I suggested the Tribune could turn itself into a local TV-like news operation online using internet delivery instead of over-the-air signals and cable. No FCC license needed, no expensive station needed, no minicams, microwave trucks, or SNG trucks needed. That it already had a competitive edge with existing higher journalism standards, even though depleted a bigger reporting staff potential far lower video technology overhead, lower personnel overhead by eliminating anchors and so on, no legacy linear news show concept to protect, and no need for black hole live shots. There were more slides, but you get the idea. Three months after my presentation in October 2019, the IRS approved the Tribune's nonprofit application my suggestions to Nelson about video during that presentation went in one ear and out the other. Since then, according to the paper's 2020 990, the Trib is still losing money, but it claims to have since increased staff, raised wages, and added employee benefits. After IRS approval, Huntsman went on CNN to explain the transition from for profit to non profit. Check out the 148-year-old Salt Lake Tribune newspaper, serving residents of Utah. Earlier this year, this paper became the first metropolitan daily in the country to go nonprofit to apply and get permission from the IRS to do so. Quite frankly, I didn't realize uh, how poor the newspaper industry or the condition that it really uh, was in and, and is in today. And if you look at the migration going from print to digital, you're replacing print dollars with digital, well, some people like to say digital dimes, I like to refer to it as digital pennies. <laughs> Unlike billionaire bailouts of newspapers like the Washington Post, Las Vegas Review Journal, New York Times, and LA Times, Paul Huntsman quickly bailed himself out, never providing sufficient capital for a complete print to digital transition. He left the Tribune, part print, part digital. 
The New York Times quoted Huntsman, My father used to say, when you're the one responsible for the payroll, it's going to keep you up at night. I didn't really appreciate that until I acquired the Salt Lake Tribune. I took the losses and subsidized the paper as long as I could. The losses were devastating to me personally. I said, I have to make a change. The Tribune now claims to be a national model for nonprofit financial success. It published a nonprofit playbook. It's a guide for other legacy newspapers to follow its leadership. It says the Salt Lake Tribune's nonprofit transition and business innovation can serve as a model for newspapers across the United States. It said the Salt Lake Tribune is pioneering one path forward for local news. Harvard University's Neiman Journalism Lab said, Now nonprofit, the Salt Lake Tribune has achieved something rare for a local newspaper, financial sustainability. The Salt Lake Tribune has plenty to celebrate in 2021. The first and so far only major newspaper to become a nonprofit is financially sustainable, and after years of layoffs and cuts, is growing its newsroom. Executive Editor Lauren Gustus announced the news. Fact check. Has the Tribune succeeded? Or is there a question? The Salt Lake Tribune will not provide evidence of its financial sustainability. It was supposed to have filed its 2021 IRS 990 financial disclosures a year ago, but it's not yet filed. Its report for 2022 is soon due. It did file its 2020 financials, but left off key information. That 2020 IRS 990 is incomplete. One page is supposed to show the salaries of its highest paid employees. The paper claimed to have done that, saying, Major donors are listed on the form as well as the compensation of the highest paid employees. But, in fact, employee salaries are not listed. That disclosure would have shown whether key employees are overpaid, fairly paid, or more likely underpaid and are essentially subsidizing the Tribune. 2020 was the first full year the Tribune operated as a nonprofit. How near did it get to sustainability, which would be operating in the black? Did its revenue go from what Huntsman called digital pennies to digital dollars? referring to what the paper makes online, not print. Because the paper is not filed as 2021 financial disclosure, we can only go by its 2020 report. That year, it lost more than $900,000. Huntsman did not just create one nonprofit in 2019, he created two. The other was the Utah Journalism Foundation, the thinking was that many Utahns, especially conservative Mormons, would not donate directly to help save a paper they despised. So Huntsman set up another foundation that did not have Tribune in its name, one whose primary mission was to funnel money to the Tribune, going from one nonprofit to another. Huntsman would initially fund it with $10 million. The goal was to raise $60 million and create an endowment and then build the endowment to $100 million by 2035. The Utah Journalism Foundation has not been transparent about its finances. ProPublica, which monitors nonprofits, shows the foundation in 2020 taking in $3.4 million, but that year it also had $1.9 million in expenses. For what? We don't know. The foundation did not file a complete 990 with the IRS. The foundation may have vanished. It still has a website and solicits donations, but it's posted no 990s on the website. The address and phone number are for the Salt Lake Tribune. The Utah Department of Commerce shows that the foundation has expired. The Salt Lake Tribune claims to be transparent. The Tribune holds independence and accountability to the public as its guiding principles. Goes on to say, we are committed to full transparency and understand this is fundamental to the trust our readers have in the Tribune. We may not have all the answers to this innovative approach to local news, but we're always happy to talk. 
feel free to email Lauren Gustus at her email address anytime. So I did. I emailed Gustus asking for an interview, disclosing in advance my general areas of inquiry. I wrote, As of right now is the trib operating fully in the black. What's the latest breakdown of revenue amounts, such as from donations, subscriptions, advertising, and money saved through tax avoidance by being a nonprofit? How has being a nonprofit impacted sustainability? Are there any new plan monetizing initiatives, such as adding to or stopping print editions, pivoting to video, and so on? Is it ethical for the TRIB to accept direct, partial, or total funding for its Solutions Innovation Lab directly from Rocky Mountain Power? Does it show a desperation for funding? Gustus replied by email, Our 990 for 2021 should be available on our site within the next few weeks. We received an extension. She didn't give a reason for the delay. At this time, we are operating in the black but no detail. We're not accepting interview requests on the matter of our sustainability. Instead, we'll soon publish a playbook that details our experience over the last three plus years. In other words, no interview, no comment. My Augustus email mentioned the Salt Lake Tribune's Innovation Lab and whether it should be funded in part by the utility Rocky Mountain Power. The Tribune's website says, we use innovation journalism to build solutions to problems that don't want to be solved. Why the Tribune is talking about solutions? The word solutions refers to the paper's practice of solutions journalism. More on that in a minute. The Trib not only gets funding for the lab from the West's largest utility, but also from the foundation of Utah's largest home builder. Who knows who else funds the project? The Tribune discloses it gets funding from Rocky Mountain Power and the Ivory Foundation. Its website says, Tim Fitzpatrick is the Salt Lake Tribune's renewable energy reporter, a position funded by a grant from Rocky Mountain Power. The Tribune retains all control over editorial decisions independent of Rocky Mountain Power. He says, rest assured that Rocky Mountain Power has no role in deciding what stories to cover, or how to cover them. I will go where the reporting takes me. But look at a story Fitzpatrick did about Ivory Holmes, one of the lab's funders, a story which included Rocky Mountain Power. Fitzpatrick's reporting took him to this story on the Trib's front page headlined, Utah's largest home builder hopes to lead a clean revolution. It said, Ivory Homes is upgrading its standards to make all new homes Energy Star certified and add energy and water saving features. The story reads like a press release wherein Ivory Homes slaps itself on the back. It included a fact that another Innovations Lab donor, Rocky Mountain Power, is excited to work with Ivory Homes. The piece was tagged with an editor's note. The Clark and Christine Ivory Foundation is a donor to the Salt Lake Tribune's Innovation Lab. It's not just the Salt Lake Tribune. It's perhaps hundreds of news outlets, large and small, lined up to get the tens of millions of grant money doled out every year by local and national foundations. They call it innovation. I call it pigs at the trough journalism. The problem, according to a detailed report by the American Press Institute, is that very few industry-wide norms or guidelines exist for accepting such funding leaving news organizations exposed to the perception or even the reality of ethical misconduct. The Tribune claims to have a firewall in place. It says, The Tribune maintains a strict firewall between governing bodies, advisors, donors, and the newsroom. That means they will have no more access to the newsroom or influence on editorial decision-making than any other members of the public, as has been the practice historically. Tribune editor Lauren Gustus, who says she does not do interviews about her paper's sustainability, did an on-camera interview about her paper's sustainability. It included a discussion about firewalls and how they get in the way of revenue. She talks about the importance of reporters being connected to, not separated from, a paper's fundraising. 
Also notice when she nods in approval as two other editors talk about tearing down their firewalls. Do we know what happens when the business goes south? So I think there's a great motivator uh, in most of our news organizations for people to understand why that connection is so important and why they've got to pay attention to what's happening with respect to their journalism such that you know, we all row in the same direction, which is toward you know, those outcomes that we need to be sustainable. You know, I think like some digital native media has is kind of has a little bit of a different approach to that sort of editorial business firewall than uh, traditional media. I found Um, my job as an editorial leader there was always very infused with with business. And I think as a startup, um, you are so uh at which Vox was, you know, when I when I started, you're so um enmeshed in building the editorial and the business at the same time that you can't really, you know, separate the two. And I don't think that's a bad thing at all. And we're very upfront with people that we hire that if you're looking for this 200 foot tall firewall between the newsroom and the and the business team and uh, that we're just not the right place for you this yeah. is the wrong job yeah. because we are going to work together on initiatives we're gonna we are gonna work you know we're gonna work hand in glove in a lot of ways to support each other and to try to make the work um try to make the business go so far in this video the solutions journalism business model and reporting method has popped up several times I've yet to explain exactly what it is. Hundreds of news outlets besides the Salt Lake Tribune have adopted it. This illustration, created by Solutions Journalism proponents, shows how it fits in. The claim is that problems in the world scream. That is to say, legacy news outlets scream out the problems, but solutions to those problems only whisper. The concept calls on reporters to give voice to solutions, That is, provide solutions a megaphone, so the solutions can also scream. As I already said, one of the Tribune's paths to sustainability was adopting so-called solutions journalism as part of its innovations lab. But that's small potatoes to its far bigger solutions journalism project, the Great Salt Lake Collaborative. Editor Augustus made the announcement. The Tribune joined 17 Utah organizations to elevate solutions for Great Salt Lake. The goal was to save the Great Salt Lake from evaporation into extinction. This is because we've hit a critical point. The lake is at its lowest level on record. The campaign is being funded in part by a national nonprofit named Solutions Journalism Network, SJN for short. It's likely unprecedented in Utah journalism history. So many news outlets, some direct competitors, joining to solve the shrinking Great Salt Lake problem. But the reporters created a journalism problem. Instead of primarily amplifying solutions, the Utah Journalism Collaborative amplified, hyped, and sensationalized the Great Salt Lake problem. The collaborative's formula seems to be First alarm everybody with the bad news, then try to make everybody feel good, suggesting solutions that are as troublesome as the problem and could cause more harm than good. One journalism educator, Everett Dennis, not referring directly to the Utah Collaborative, but to the solutions journalism concept generally, calls it chicken little journalism, named after the henny penny chicken little fairy tale. Dennis says it's like Chicken Little, waiting for the sky to fall. And he calls reporters who use the concept alarmists and those who promote it cult-like evangelists eager to convert other reporters to their kind of journalism. Here's a sampling of how some collaborative reporters describe the problem. It's a doomsday scenario hurtling toward Utah how the LDS church could prevent its headquarters from becoming a toxic wasteland. Windstorms from the dry lake bed hurl arsenic into the air. Deadly dust filled with cancer-causing arsenic. Poisonous dust clouds threaten Salt Lake City. Great Salt Lake risk threatens the greatest snow on earth. We're facing this existential threat as far as our life is concerned, and... 
looming environmental nuclear bomb. It got no better when it comes to solutions. Among reported potential solutions touted by the collaborative, pump ocean water from the Pacific to Utah. That solution would have cost billions of dollars and required enormous amounts of electricity. Install cloud seeding generators across the state to make it rain more and thin Utah's mountain forest so trees don't suck up so much water before it runs to the lake. Okay, I'm not making this part up. It's not fake news. The Utah Collaborative's crisis coverage is held out as one of the best examples of solutions journalism in the United States. It won a top national award among 96 entries. The Great Salt Lake Collaborative wins $20,000 prize in Local That Works contest. Here's a couple of other headlines. Even the Collaborative's contest submission was sensationalized, and it still won. Judges overlooked the Utah submission scaremongering. This was in the submission. An existential crisis. Disaster catastrophe looming. Looming environmental nuclear bomb. Really dire. The dust is filled with cancer-causing, naturally occurring arsenic. Besides the fear-mongering, the Utah Collaborative cheated to win. It broke purportedly cardinal solution journalism rules. One of the top misconceptions about solutions journalism, the rule says, is that it advocates for a specific solution or proposes a solution that doesn't yet exist. We consider them to be solutions journalism imposters. Solutions journalism stories are about programs and policies that are already being implemented. Pumping seawater from the Pacific, thinning forests, and statewide cloud seeding are not solutions that exist. Meanwhile, Mother Nature has been raining and snowing on the Collaborative's parade. Rain and snow have been falling from the sky, not acorns. Alda breaks a snowfall record after latest Utah storm. Rainy days in Utah are raising water levels at Great Salt Lake. And in 1983, Salt Lake City became a river. With Utah snowpack, could floods be next? So, how did Utah's legislature react after being bombarded with henny-penny, sky-is-falling stories? It did not pass a single proposed emergency funding measure. It appropriated less money to save the Great Salt Lake during this year's session than last year's. Canadian David Bornstein, now living in New York, is the world's leading solutions journalism evangelist. He's the author of the bestseller, How to Change the World. His nonprofit, Solutions Journalism Network, pays news outlets like the Utah Collaborative that adopt his reporting philosophy. His appearance on PBS's NewsHour is just one of dozens, if not hundreds, of public appearances in support of his cause. David Bornstein is the co-founder of the Solutions Journalism Network, an organization that works with news organizations to produce rigorous reporting on responses to social problems. The goal, to rebalance the news. I mean, we are amply informed about what's going wrong, about what's ugly, about what's corrupt. But because we don't have um, a similar amount of information about what's growing, what are the new possibilities emerging, we have a very flawed kind of one-sided view. It, it's as if your, your parents were only ever criticizing what you did and never letting you know where you had possibilities to grow. I'm not denying that we should cover violence. The point is it's not the only truth. We should tell the whole story. Before Bornstein explains his reporting method, he begins by telling how he claims most reporters define traditional news gathering. He says journalists usually define news as what's gone wrong. Then he defines his concept. Solutions journalism tries to expand that definition. Responses to problems are also newsworthy. By adding rigorous coverage of solutions, journalists can tell the whole story. My charitable view is that it does not advocate a ban on reporting bad news. 
Instead, it calls for reporting right doing and solutions in addition to reporting wrongdoing. It advocates making news consumers feel good about bad news. My less charitable view, it is a feel-good fad that has popped up at least three times in the last century. It's proof hucksterism in the journalism sector is alive and well. Even journalists and journalism educators who should have a high regard for facts and accuracy are easily taken in. I call it Mary Poppins journalism. Just as a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down, a spoonful of possible solutions makes bad news go down. Bornstein promotes his reporting concept using that false depiction of how traditional journalists purportedly define news, the one I just mentioned a minute ago. It's a straw man argument that sets up his attack on traditional journalism. Bornstein puts words in mainstream reporters' mouths by claiming they define news as what's gone wrong and that only bad news is covered. He repeats his talking points over and over. Journalists usually define news as what's gone wrong. Rather than merely investigating what's going wrong, solutions journalism explores what's going right, too, offering a fuller picture of our world. With solutions journalism, reporters cover more than just bad news. What's Bornstein's source? I ask him. I interviewed Bornstein by phone and we exchanged emails, at least until he quit responding. I told him that after I studied journalism in college, after working as a reporter covering thousands of news stories, after teaching journalism in the United States and Germany, I'd never heard news defined that way. Not even close. Where did he get it? He said thousands of journalists he's met define it that way. I asked, did you bother to check any journalism textbook definitions? Did you bother to ask any journalism instructors how they define news and how they teach that definition? I emailed Bornstein definitions from textbooks I used when I taught journalism at BYU. They were written long before he formed his nonprofit. This textbook says, news is what is happening in the world but only a tiny fraction of any day's events is ever reported. The book added a list of factors that further refine the definition. One of the factors is impact. How many people the news affects and how seriously it affects them determines its importance as news. So does the extent to which the information may be useful. Another book I use says, news is a recounting of factual information about events situations, and ideas calculated to interest an audience and help people cope with themselves and their environment. Neither textbook definition restricts legacy news to only bad news or to only what's wrong. I not only question how Bornstein's nonprofit defines news, I also question how efficiently it manages millions of dollars. You don't need to be a Woodward or Bernstein to quickly uncover something fishy about the Solutions Journalism Network's money management. These figures are taken from its 2021 IRS 990 disclosure. It has more than $13.8 million in the bank. It paid Bornstein that year $233,000. But now I'm getting to the murkiest part. Total staff salaries... 3.9 million grants to local news organizations cannot be used for salaries. 1.55 million. Is that fishy? Bornstein's single organization spends almost 4 million a year on salaries alone, not counting other expenses, while hundreds of news organizations share about 1.5 million in grants, and even that cannot be used for salaries. Let's do a comparison between the Solutions Journalism Network and the American Journalism Project. They're both intermediary charities. They both solicit grants from huge foundations, then make subgrants to local news organizations. The American Journalism Project is much larger than Bornstein's. First, comparing CEO pay. 
233,000 to 211,000. All salaries, 3.9 million to 2.8 million. Grants to news outlets, 1.5 million to 8.2 million. To close out this section on solutions journalism, here's a quick look at its family tree. The solutions journalism concept has popped up at least three times over the past century. First named constructive journalism, then civic or public journalism, before today's iteration. The first wave, constructive journalism, was pretty much dead when I attended journalism school. At that time, its close cousin, advocacy journalism, was the hotter discussion topic. The second wave, civic journalism, was also called public journalism and from time to time constructive as well. That movement faded, didn't quite die out, and segued into today's version. Constructive journalism was championed by University of Wisconsin journalism professor Willard Blyer. It aimed to give news that is significant to readers from their point of view, as well as from that of the welfare of the community. News should guide public opinion and have a wholesome effect on readers. Newspapers should go beyond reporting in an accurate but colorless manner without consideration for its effect upon their readers. It caught on like wildfire, then was extinguished in the 1930s. The second wave hit from about 1988 to 2002. There were several high-profile proponents. Some wrote books, but James Batten, who was with Knight Ritter, led the effort to put it into practice. Under the concept, the journalist's job is to improve the community's capacity to act on the news, helping people engage in a search for solutions. It's not a disease model, but a healthy public life model. A whole journalism would not stop at exposing ills, it would also focus on creating a healthy public climate. The second wave had begun on the heels of a newspaper economic downturn. Critics believed the movement was not actually about engaging citizens, but instead was a marketing ploy to revitalize shrinking newsroom profits. Jonathan Yardley, a Washington Post columnist, called it journalistic high-mindedness and an insidious, dangerous idea. The highly dubious but momentarily fashionable business of public journalism. He said it was meant to keep newspapers in business. It is now the prevailing orthodoxy in many Knight Ritter newsrooms. David Bornstein created Constructive Journalism 3.0. His version is also about money. He says negativity in the news is one of the leading drivers of news avoidance. Solutions journalism, done right, can increase memberships and bring in more revenue for news organizations. We may discover that the way to save journalism is to improve the news product to make it genuinely helpful. Finally, Bornstein is adamant that solutions journalism is not advocacy journalism. For example, he and his devotees say, Experts in solutions journalism would argue that calling it advocacy simply isn't true. Most journalists are uncomfortable writing about solutions, which they may misinterpret as advocacy. Solutions journalism isn't activism or advocacy. With regard to Bornstein's claim that his brand of journalism is not advocacy, my response is, Do you think I'm an idiot? Look, if it walks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, and if it smells like a duck's behind, it's a duck. Bornstein's false claim about advocacy is much like the Fox News pronouncement that it's fair and balanced. No, it's not. Saying so does not make it so. This final section takes a closer look at advertising. After having been given up for dying or dead as a viable revenue source, it could, maybe should become, the key revenue source for online news outlets, rather than a secondary source, or no source at all.
At first glance, it makes absolutely no sense to prioritize advertising income. Look at the facts. Ongoing steady loss of advertising revenue is a major cause of the local news crisis, resulting in hundreds of dead and dying newspapers. Between 2005 and 2021, advertising revenue for newspapers fell 80%, from about $50 billion to $9.6 billion. Was advertising ever a good fit? Victor Pickard, professor at the Annenberg School, says, Throughout much of the 20th century, newspapers typically derived 80% of the revenue from advertisers and 20% from readers. This was a partnership of convenience that camouflaged what was in fact an unnatural union. As consumers and advertisers migrated to the web, where digital ads pay pennies to the dollar of traditional print ads, and most of that money goes to Google and Facebook, The 150-year-old business model for commercial newspapers imploded. To compensate for the loss of revenue, some news organizations resort to sensationalized clickbait or blur the distinction between news and advertising, which is another way of describing crumbling firewalls. Also, why bring back a funding model that can damage credibility? With declining newspaper circulation and increasing competition for advertising dollars, ad sales departments experience rising pressure from advertisers who often attempt to control news stories and threaten to withdraw advertising over unfavorable coverage. With interference getting worse, why not let advertising diminish or even expire as a revenue source? Why make it a priority? then why prioritize advertising? It's the devil we know, better than we know the nonprofit and billionaire devils. Advertising is still working extremely well for video-centric local television news and fairly well for dying print newspapers. Advertising right now is resurging in popularity for entertainment video as consumers suffer subscription fatigue. Digital ad effectiveness is more easily tracked than print and broadcast ads. It's a greater value for advertisers. Local news outlets could establish in-house ad agencies, creating new profit centers. And local advertising can help strengthen a community's economy. Scott Broadbeck, CEO of the local news provider ARL Now, says, I think the advertising business model is the one that's going to support the largest number of local digital outlets. The demand is there. Local businesses still need to market themselves and reach consumers. Like it or not, consumers want news for free. So you need to develop unique ad products, need to work with advertisers on their messaging. Many communities like this one shown in a satellite shot have hundreds of potential local advertisers. Too many communities have no news outlets, print or online, to carry ads. Advertising can be, and for many local news operations already is, a profit center. Smartphones can bring the same huge video production cost reductions to an advertising department as they can to a news department. But it's also why news and advertising policies and procedures need to be firmly established along with a strong firewall between the two departments. However, Neil Chase of CalMatter says firewalls should not limit understanding between employees on either side. Firewalls are there to block interference, not communication. There's this mythical wall between advertising and editorial that was done wrong for a long time. The, the wall is not about keeping people on the editorial side from understanding the business that's funding their jobs. The wall is about making sure the advertising doesn't change your editorial work. I think Cal Matters has the potential of becoming a California journalism powerhouse, but one that still maintains traditional values. Among its policies, we want to be transparent about the funding of our news organization and how we work. We are editorially independent from all revenue sources and nonpartisan. We maintain a firewall between news coverage decisions and sources of revenue. 
Advertisers and sponsors benefit from reaching a highly informed and engaged audience. I should mention that Neil Chase is bearish, not bullish, on advertising priority business models. He told a reporter that there is no longer a business model for for for-profit journalism based on local advertising that is sustainable in maybe any market. But he probably does not take into account the potential power of smartphone video for both news and advertising production. Ken Doctor, the local digital news expert who I quoted earlier in this video, the one who also founded his own online news outlet, Lookout Santa Cruz, believes advertising is being overlooked as a key revenue source. Is that I see so much in the, in the digital news startup world to focus on reader revenue, which we also strongly believe in, but people really uh, aren't putting that much energy into advertising. And then the conferences started back up and I go to these conferences and I say like, well, we're doing this. And they'll go like, yes, it has potential. And go like, no, it doesn't have potential. It has reality. And this idea that, you know, we, we heard in the industry that Google and Facebook have taken all the local advertising and that we can only focus on, on reader revenue is a big problem. For those who had local news outlets that do rely on advertising, I suggest they subscribe to Streaming Media Magazine and Digiday Online. That's the end. If you have questions, comments, or suggested corrections, you can email me at lpacker636 at gmail.com.